Um, Dr. Alex Deegan is the science and technology advisor to the administrator at USAID, and he heads the Office of Science and Technology. As USAID's chief scientist, Dr. Dagan is responsible for implementing the administrator's vision to ensure that USAID is the global leader on employing science, technology, and creativity to help solve development problems. Prior to coming to USAID, Dr. Dagan worked for the Department of State, most recently as senior scientist and policy advisor to the Secretary of State. Dr. Dagan was also senior advisor to the special advisor for the Gulf and Southwest Asia, where he developed a science diplomacy engagement strategy with the Islamic Republic of Iran, advised on internal polit political dynamics, and served as the liaison to the Office of the Special Representative to the President for Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, Dr. Dagan was the founding Afghanistan Country Director for the Wildlife Conservation Society's Afghanistan Diversity Conservation Program. Dr. Dagan holds a PhD and MSc from the University of Chicago in biology, from evolution or biology, a law degree from the University of California, a BS degrees in zoology and political science from Duke University. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. Dagan. I think I'll use the, this mic right here. Well, Ed, I really appreciate you paying all these people to show up uh, uh, early morning on exam day, and uh, howdy. Um, it's, it's really an honor to, 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 to be here today. Uh, and just to give you sort of a, one fact that I think Texas A&M should be really proud of, we had a global competition of 700, uh, 500 applications from 49 states, 33 countries, uh, and uh, Texas A&M, we went through 50 peer review panels on the first round on the concept notes, a second round of peer review on the full applications. They then had to actually go to a pitch session uh, with uh, trying to present before us in a DVC, and then we selected seven institutions to, to actually win this award, win this, become one of our agency's development lab. And for us, it's, it's, it's not unlike the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at Caltech. How can we actually create centers and universities that can help us solve the biggest challenges of our time? So I, I, I actually just want to applaud you, and you guys should applaud yourself for, for, for winning this award. I mean. And the, the, the second thing I just want to say is, is uh, uh, I, had the, I had the pleasure of, of working in Iraq in 2004, and, and this was actually one of my favorite pictures. Uh, when I went there, there wasn't the Texan flag over Saddam Hussein's face, so this used to be a picture of Saddam that was on a wall, and if you can read it, it says, Iraq good, US good, Saddam donkey, which, uh, which I always kind of liked. But, but it does speak of, of the service of this university uh, to our country. And, and this lab represents that service. And I want to thank the university, its cadets, its history, its traditions of serving our country and advancing our national security. And this is really another important way to, to, to be able to do so. Part of what I want to talk about today is, is this concept of next generation national security. Um, and if we think about some of the changes that are happening on our planet, one example is climate change. This was a study that looked at 28,000 different biological and physical processes and found that 90% of them are changing consistent with climate change. Leaves are unfolding at different times. Rain is falling in different times in different amounts. We're seeing entire shifts in weather patterns, how water is moving through the system. Uh, pollinators are, are, are moving at different times. Uh, uh, fundamentally, the planet is actually changing. And it is not just the climatic changes, but it's also the environmental degradation. This is a lemur species I used to work with in Madagascar. And what we are seeing is, is, is we're in the middle of one of the biggest extinction periods within uh, our planet's history. And so many of these species, which are biologically important for our own survival as humans, are disappearing off the face of the earth. And 
we've only really evaluated about 3% of those species in terms of understanding their, uh, their ability to survive. Just to give you one example in terms of lemurs, there was, when I was in Madagascar and left Madagascar in 2001, there were 45 known species of lemurs. Lemurs are primates. And so it's pretty hard to miss a primate in a forest. You notice primates in the forest when, when you see them. Uh, as of present, there's 104 species of lemurs in Madagascar. So we have doubled in a period of about 10 years, just over 10 years, the number of species of primates within a place where 90% of the forest has been cut. And that gives you some idea of how little we actually know about the biodiversity of these places that are being rapidly lost. And in fact, when you lose that forest, it, it stops raining in those areas because there's no more transpiration between the forest and the climate. And, and when it stops raining, those areas, the forests are actually burned, uh, they're cut down, and when it stops raining, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, they burn down the forest and then they can grow crops on it for about three years and then they have to move to another patch of forest to clear it. And those places where it stops raining within 20 years are essentially biological deserts. Very little actually grows on it. The other thing we see is that there's this linkage of those places that are being deforested are also places that we're seeing this intersection between wildlife, domestic animals, and human health, this idea of one health. And in fact, new diseases are emerging at unprecedented rates, and that 60% uh, of emerging infectious diseases are shared between humans and animals. And of those zoonotic diseases, 72% uh, are originating in wildlife. So where we are bringing humans in contact with the wildlife because of the degradation, we're not only seeing the changes in climate, but we're seeing the spread of disease and in an increased globalized world that those diseases affect us and we bring those diseases uh, back at home. Um, most of us around here uh, with the Borlaug Institute so close know these numbers. Uh, by 2050, we're gonna have nine billion people. Those nine billion people are gonna require 70% more food. The bigger issue is what happens when people emerge out of extreme poverty. And, and, and the one fact is they drink more milk and they eat more meat. And to produce that milk and to produce that meat takes a substantial greater amount of investment of inputs to feed the cattle. You're essentially feeding an inefficient process along the way. Where are we gonna actually grow those crops that we require for that 70% more food, it's gonna be clearing natural ecosystems, uh, the Amazon basin, the Cerrado in Brazil, uh, the Sub-Saharan Central Africa. Um, it is a loss of uh, a total area that is equal to the United States that would, that would have to be used. And we're seeing this effort of actually people outsourcing agriculture to other countries, which is really unusual. Of, of countries in Asia looking to Africa to grow food that does not go back to Africans, that does not go back to people who actually need those nutritional calories. But it's also thinking about what else is needed. It's doubling the amount of water that we need. It is three times as much phosphorus, twice as much uh, nitrogen, uh, three times as much pesticides, and that's eutrophication that we're gonna see coming because of those things. There was a great article in this month's National Geographic actually talking about nitrogen inputs, and, and we have to fundamentally think about how do we actually increase productivity and decrease our environmental footprint at the same time to be able to do that. Let's see if I can get this to advance. Uh, 2.8 billion people the world's poor do not have access to improved drinking water, um, but, but even more efficiently, 70% of water use goes to agriculture. So in places where we're seeing increased uh, temperatures and decreased precipitation due to climate change, due to variability in those patterns, um, this fundamentally affects what we're able to do in terms of, of, of being able to feed people, of, of how we can try to address problems of ending hunger. Um, 2.6 billion people in the world don't have access to reliable energy. What, 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 it, it is a really connecting the last mile problem. It is how do, we, how do we actually extend the grids? But even more fundamentally, it's 
how do we create the energy systems of the future rather than trying to rebuild the energy systems of the past within what we're trying to do? The biggest issue that I'm worried about uh, in, in energy is, is this question of, uh, sorry, just trying to get this to advance. What happens when those people actually want air conditioning? Because when the bottom billions want air conditioning, one of the most energy intensive things, how are we going to try to meet that need and what does that mean uh, for the planet in terms of, of what we're trying to do? The other, the other fact that we're, we are seeing is uh, a massive shift in where the people's world live. We just flipped the point where we went to 51% uh, of the world living in urban areas. And in fact, urbanization, uh, most of the urban places in the world are in the developing world. But they exist in what are called peri-urban environments. These are the areas around cities that literally stretch for miles of people who are unconnected to sanitation, unconnected to energy, do not have access to education, and the severe challenges that we have to face uh, as a result of that. The other thing to realize is as we're thinking about future economic growth of the United States, we have to think about where is that going to come from. It's not going to come from the developed world for the most part. 51 developed countries by 2050 will lose population, will slow down in terms of their ability to have economic growth. The future of our country actually depends in the developing world. Our ability to prepare our students, the next generations, to take advantage of those opportunities that are in the developing world. And we have to think about uh, how do we reposition our economy to be able to do so? But one of the things I think that fundamentally worries me it, it, is this fact. You guys in this room, uh, we have Wi-Fi here on the Texas A&M campus, are connected to more knowledge in human history than we've ever had before. And you can pull it up on a smartphone, you can pull it up on your computer. What worries me are those people who do not have access who are the disconnected. Because that gulf between you and someone in Somalia is accelerating exponentially every day, every second. And that gulf is a gulf of despair, despondency, of, of, of people who have legitimate grievances in terms of, of, of what they're trying to, to do. Uh, and, and for us, those individuals who are disconnected are the individuals that are most like and who are hungry and do not have access to knowledge and tools to save themselves are going to be the individuals who are going to be susceptible to extremist uh, religions, extremist philosophies, and, and, and essentially potential threats to, to the future security of the world. We can look at places if we're thinking about these trends, we can look at important places on the world. This picture, um, we are, we're lucky in the Office of Science and Technology. We have a scientist, uh, uh, Ron Guerin, who came off the International Space Station. He's actually, uh, he's an astronaut that's based here in Houston that works with our office and is helping us on data and how to share data better among organizations. Spent a year on the International Space Station and really came up with this idea of an orbital perspective. And you get an image uh, of what that orbital perspective looks like when you look at Egypt and you look at Cairo in particular. And the one thing you'll notice is where is population density in Egypt? It's an enormous country, but most people live upon the Nile and are entirely dependent on the Nile. And in fact, if you looked at a satellite image during the day of vegetation, all that agriculture is directly right next to the Nile. The problem we have in these basins are what happens when the upstream neighbors of the Nile are now going to abrogate colonial treaties to dramatically decrease the amount of water that's actually flowing into these areas. And we're seeing a huge problem. They need more water because of the population problems. There's a huge youth bulge in Egypt and Sudan and all the downstream neighbors. So water is this precious resource that potentially could serve as an igniter of conflict in an area that we already know is pretty unstable that has substantial challenges in what we're trying to do. So our question is, how do we actually increase the efficiency through the use of science, technology, and innovation to provide those opportunities to people? Um, this, is a, this is Syria. 
obviously Syria, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, these are places that we're worried with. And on one hand, uh, we are happy to have democracy occur in, in, in Tunisia, in Libya, in Egypt. On the other hand, it is unclear what the ultimate implications of those things are. The conflict is actually a characteristic of our livelihoods. 1.5 billion people on this planet live in countries affected by violent conflict. Conflicts affects 49 countries around the world. 29 of them are in the midst of active ongoing armed conflict. 20 of them are countries that have just come out of conflict. And what we see is a link between fragility and conflict. This has huge costs for development. Africa loses $18 billion a year due to civil war, to war, to insurgency. It shrinks African nations' economies by 15% when there is a conflict, and that is a really conservative estimate. 52% uh, of the world's poor, where we're going to find one of our places that have poor governance and they're in the midst of conflict. And no single conflict or fragile state has yet to achieve a single UN uh, Millennium Development Goal. If our hope in, uh, to, is to end extreme poverty on this planet, to end hunger, conflict in these states that are fragile have to be our focus. And 57% of our treasury in terms of foreign assistance overseas are spent on those kinds of states. So this center at Texas A&M is actually incredibly important. The underlying message is that conflict equals poverty. That conflict is incredibly important. And that, and that if we are thinking about things like mass atrocities, 67% of mass atrocities since 1945 have occurred in the context of armed conflicts. They break down the social contract between people and their governments. They, they create the opportunities for atrocities to occur. And, uh, we should think, and, and one of the things that, w that USAID wants to get out of the center is how can we fundamentally get better insights into conflict? How do we understand stand under uh, the drivers of conflict, starting with governance, but also environment and natural resources degradation, food security, youth, and, and their role within conflict? And how do we use that to actually get ahead of the problem, to fundamentally be able to make our work in development, the fundamental way of achieving national security. This, by the way, is a picture from Afghanistan. This is Buzkashi, which is the predecessor of the polo. Some of you may know of it. Uh, they use a headless goat uh, instead of uh, polo ball and stick. It makes it a little more exciting game, a little bit harder to actually carry it around. But I always thought that pretty much defined uh, the parliament within uh, many of the countries in which I've worked, including Iran, Afghanistan, Iraq. This, this was a picture for me of, of, of thinking about conflict and, and what we wanted, uh, wanted to, to try to avoid. So conflict fundamentally is this failure of the social contract. It is limited interactions between governments and their citizens that translates into poor governance, corruption, citizen alienation, and discrimination. Um, there is, for those countries that have uh, continued weaknesses in government effectiveness, rule of law and control of corruption have a 30 to 45% higher risk of civil war. Uh, so the question is, how do declining environmental problems, food security, health, and environment play a role in undermining institutions and governance? How can development actually promote democracy and governance in what we're trying to do? Uh, and, and one of the things we want to think about is how can we fundamentally use the power of science and technology? And you know, the problems that we face are, are pretty substantial. Um, we have this condition of billions of people, this is Madagascar again, uh, have access to a few centuries of human technological processes, but another billion people or so uh, do not. It is that accelerating gulf. The challenges that we face, aid has traditionally done its programs within individual countries, but the challenges we face are actually transboundary. And in fact, our national security increasingly depends if we're looking at pathogens and diseases and, and, and food crises on what happens around the world. Um, 
the other thing is just to recognize we have tended to provide development assistance to the developing world in a one-way relationship, but in fact, there are many awesome ideas within the developing world. How do we make use of those within what we're trying to do? So one of the tools that we have is just basic genetics. And to give you one example, um, we have the Human Genome Project, which back in 1999, took $2.7 billion and 13 years to sequence a single genome of a single individual. It was a massive effort by the United States uh, to, to invest in these resources spearheaded by the National Institutes of Health. Today, you can sequence a genome for about $1,000 in approximately a few days, that same effort. So thinking about that power of technology, that acceleration, that exponential power. How do we use these when we are thinking about conflict? How do we use these to fundamentally re-engineer plants to give us the food security that we need? We've seen the same thing in terms of computing power. Moore's laws, the number of transistors placed within a computer can double every 18 months. We have essentially uh, given away storage for free. Your Flickr accounts, your Dropbox accounts, are the fact that it costs almost nothing to provide access to storage, and that has been increasing exponentially. Uh, I think the, the Voyagers, which are now at the, literally have passed the edge of the solar system, had something like 16K of memory in them, and were unbelievably technologically advanced in 1979. And if you think about the power of the internet, it is, it, supercomputers today, if, if, if you go to that small trade school, uh, University of Texas, you'll see uh, a, a, a supercomputer there, uh, I believe it's called Stampede, which is literally network sets of individual computers. And in fact, that's what the internet itself is is a network set of computers and individuals connected together in unprecedented ways um, that has become uh, incredibly powerful. The other thing is we're connected in really new ways. So it took 20 years for the first 100 million cell phones in Africa. It took three years to get to 300 million. We're now at 700 million cell phones in Africa. And in fact, a kid with a smartphone in Africa today, which is now predominantly the types of phones that people have, has more power at his or her fingertips than President Clinton did at the beginning of his administration in terms of access to information. That, for me, is really stunning. So the question is, how do we harness the power of technology, of engineering, of science, of genetics, to be able to address these problems? The other issue is we have an unprecedented amount of data and access to data around the world. The, the, the critical aspect is how do we structure it? And to give you one idea is 2011, we produced more data than the entire previous years in human history that was captured. So how do you actually make use of that data to get fundamental insights into what people are doing? And in fact, there are new studies that are showing uh, our squared values of 0.95, our ability to actually predict dengue outbreaks based on internet searches. Google, uh, Google has done the same thing with flu outbreaks. People are looking at Twitter uh, as a way of actually looking at economic outcomes. People are looking at whether people are buying cell phone uh, credit as a way of having real time access to whether there are economic crises or not. And how do we identify that in a very specific geospatially uh, based way of, of answering these questions. Uh, and we also have this other thing, which is, for a long time, human manufacturing has actually been centralized. It's been really focused on individual countries, particularly Asia, uh, most recently, has been the focus of, of manufacturing. But within 20 years, my guess is we'll see a flip, particularly with the development of 3D printers and this movement called Maker's Fairs, of people developing individual designs, adaptations, and iterations that are produced locally. On, you can buy a 3D printer for $2,000. Uh, that wasn't very much more than what it cost me to get a laser writer when I was in college in terms of what I could afford, what I couldn't afford it, but what, what was available at the time. That that kind of power is available to you. And what's kind of cool is the 3D printers themselves can, can actually produce 70% of the parts it produces to make another 3D printer. So pretty soon we can actually see them self-replicate. 
So how do we use, it'd be kind of cool to see 3D printers running around campus. Uh, we could have a 3D printer hunt. Uh, but, um, so how do we actually transform development? And, and what we're trying to do at USAID uh, is, is build the Terminator uh, in a manner of speaking. It's, it's actually how do we create a DARPA for development? DARPA is the institution that built drones, that, that created the internet in 1969, that created the driverless cars through the competition that they actually had. And the question, the question is, uh, if we are thinking about development in different ways, can we take principles from DARPA and rethink how we're doing development? How do we actually focus on revolutionary outcomes rather than incremental ones? How do we actually encourage creativity? How do we think about failure and allow for failure? Because failure is part of an iterative process. And in, in development, we have nothing but successes. You go to the USAID website, it's got a whole list of successes. You will not see a list of failures. Congress, I don't think, would like that, I think, for some reasons. But the fact is, failure is part of the process of learning. And we've got to actually understand and acknowledge failure to get insights from it and to make better decisions. And in fact, our very fundamental dated systems within our agency don't allow us to do that. Um, we have to use evidence. We have to use that data. We have to have data to allow us to have real-time understanding of what the problems are. And we have to take and focus on the big challenges. I think far too long we've been focused on uh, small pilots for small problems as an agency. And the fact is we've got to look at how do we fundamentally end the big problems and take on the big problems and really harness the great tools of American capacity. I can back away, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Um, and those great tools exist right here on this campus. It's harnessing academia in terms of what we're trying to do. Data is one of those pieces, and one example that, that I think is fundamentally new for aid is we're actually using crowdsourced information to understand conflict in Syria in real time to get a better picture because we cannot get people on the ground. So how can we at least get insight and then curate that data in a way to understand what's going on. There's another tool from my field, I'm a conservation biologist, called iNaturalist, that is actually allowing people with smartphones, you can download the app for your phone, to actually survey wildlife around the world. Scientists will curate and actually do the identifications and we can create databases of things like amphibians. They've already been able to document 67% of the species on the planet uh, in terms of individual identifications uh, of, of all amphibians through something the Smithsonian did called the bio blitz. The other thing is aid has tended to focus on solutions. It's people in the past, we have said, we know what the answer is, we just need to implement it. But the fact is we don't have actually access to all the solutions. We don't necessarily understand all the problems. We don't think about um, how do we literally fundamentally crowdsource the world. And one of the things that we've been trying to do is launch a series of open innovation challenges. These are, we worked with the Gates Foundation, and in fact the person, a guy named Rick Klausner, the former head of the National Cancer Institute, uh, who created the grand challenges at Gates to create something that was a little more applied and translational. How do we actually crowdsource the world to figure out all the solutions to the problem? And the very first one we did was called Saving Lives at Birth. And it was a fundamental question. It was how do we ensure all women from the onset of, of labor to 48 hours after delivery have access to medical care, whether in a hospital or a hut? How do we make the fact of where they're giving birth irrelevant to whether or not they're gonna, have, they're gonna survive childbirth? and their children are going to survive childbirth. And what we saw was incredible. The first thing we did is we partnered up with a number of different institutions. And in fact, through the grand challenges, we've raised $140 million of outside funding to apply to these big problems that aid has identified. But the other piece of it was we got some extraordinary solutions. And what was really cool about those solutions is some of them were developed by undergrads. One of them is here called the Pratt Pouch. And what it is, is it didn't bring one with me, but it looks like your stand-up ketchup pouch. And uh, 
you know, one of the questions we have to think about, do people in the developing world know how to open up a ketchup pouch, right? And that's actually part, we have to think about that in the design, right? These are the kind of questions we take for granted. But what it does is allow us to skip the cold chain, to actually provide retroviral drugs to children. If you provide retroviral drugs to children within 48 hours of their birth, you can help prevent them from getting HIV and help them passing on the disease. But the problem is most women do not give birth in clinics. They're not near hospitals. They're not in a place that has electricity that allow you to refrigerate those drugs. And this is what this pouch did, is allowed us to deliver those drugs without a cold chain to the people they need them for, for, for very little money, a few cents in, in, in the case of the Pratt pouch. What was really incredible about the pouch, Pratt pouch was it wasn't developed by NIH, it wasn't developed by uh, PATH, which is a phenomenal organization that develops new tools for engineering. It was developed by a group, uh, a class of undergraduate biomedical engineers at Duke University. And it got voted last year as one of the top 10 most innovative solutions for global health by the World Health Organization. We're also thinking about prizes, and I like prizes. I think I like getting prizes, right? I think we all like getting prizes. But, but what really inspired me about prizes was a really short guy. Uh, his name, he, he's a Greek guy. His name's Peter Diamentis. He always wanted to go to space. And he was really cool. He just wanted to go to space. Super smart, graduated from Princeton at the top of his class, wanted to go to space, applied to NASA, got rejected. Applied to NASA again, he got rejected again. Too short to go to space. So he actually decided that he was gonna find a way to get to space. And he was gonna do it by having a prize. He didn't have any money, but he was gonna have a prize. He was gonna convince people to put up $10 million for what was called the Ansari X Prize. I'm sure you guys have heard of it. Uh, and it was a simple prize. The first company to take three people to 100 kilometers, essentially low Earth orbit, twice in a week, wins $10 million. 17 companies applied and spent $100 million trying to solve a $10 million prize. And it's called the Ansari X Prize because the first private citizen, female citizen to go to space, Anusha Ansari, gave him $2.5 million of that prize. And I believe she is from Houston. Uh, she is definitely from Texas. He raised that money and in fact, one of those companies actually, this is the, the spaceship that won that prize had solved the prize, but what was more extraordinary was it changed how NASA was getting into low Earth orbit. That prize created an entire industry of getting into space. And what was really great was it was fundamentally different from what aid has done in the past, which is we give people grants and we hope that they will be successful. And, and when I mention prizes, people are like, whoa, that's really risky. You can't do a prize. And I'm like, well, we only pay if you are successful, if you have solved the prize. Tell me an aid grant that demonstrates that. And in fact, it's a rethinking of how can we actually do those kinds of things. We've also used, um, sorry, the thing is taking a little bit of time to advance. And, and, and then the other aspect of what we're trying to do is how do we actually create the high risk, high reward research funds? And for us, it's the idea of a tricorder, right, from, from Star Trek. It is how do we create the diagnostics, all the elements, and this was inspired by saving lives at birth, how do we create the diagnostics that are necessary to provide world-class healthcare that doesn't require a hospital to anyone, that allows us not to take five to six weeks to actually develop the, to the analyses that we need to determine if someone has TB and malaria. And one of the basic ideas there, we have these incredible computers called iPhones. In fact, the first, second generations, people are actually giving them away for free, uh, selling them to Gazelle online pretty cheaply. Excuse me, I'm gonna have my Mark Rubio moment. <laughs> but what a group at Berkeley and another group at UCLA, and in fact, there are many other groups that are doing this, have developed our, our iPhones connected to these very simple lenses that cost $20 that can do automated detection of TB and malaria in the field, that replace microscopes that cost hundreds of dollars, that replace tests that used to take significant amount of time, that used to occupy laboratories, 
and they can do them within that hut, that remote setting that is out there. Thinking about, we spend our time thinking about how to grow more food, how to make plants produce more. But what are alternative sources of protein that can actually feed livestock to those middle classes? How do we actually just increase our efficiency in terms of things like post-harvest waste? How do we fundamentally rethink those problems and look at the over-the-horizon technologies? And that's not to replace our existing investments, but to complement them, right? To allow us to have those, those, those um, new approaches. And then um, this actually has to do with conflict and I'm trying to get it to move forward. Uh, and I actually don't know if this does anything anymore. I think someone in the back just might be pushing the forward button when I raise up my arm, but there's that recognition. Um, three, uh, two weeks ago, the first uh, microsatellite by a group called uh, Cosmogia went up. And their goal, their group of former NASA scientists that decided to create a real-time Google Earth. So they're putting up 100 microsatellites at a cost of $17,000 instead of a billion dollars a satellite, $17,000 a satellite. They're making them in a warehouse in San Francisco. And they're putting up over 120 of them to ring the planet. Five meter resolution images uh, updated daily. So the, uh, their basic goal is how do we outlaw war? How do we actually make the planet transparent to be able to understand environmental change, to actually be able to understand what's going on, but also to outlaw war. How do we use this for peace? And it's extraordinary because these guys are doing this. The, they, 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 um, it's frugal engineering. It's world-class engineering, but it's frugal engineering in terms of how they're trying to build this. And it speaks about what are the power of students, of youth, of engineers, to be able to fundamentally rethink how we do things. Uh, Two, two last things we're going we're gonna to talk about. So thinking about conflict, why, why did we invest in this center at, U, at Texas A&M? Uh, it came about because we were thinking fundamentally differently about how do we address conflict. And one of the things we realized was uh, our deputy administrator, Don Steinberg, was in the Clinton administration when Rwanda happened. And he was sitting uh, about a year ago in a national security meeting and he had this horrible feeling of helplessness that there was about to be an outbreak of atrocities within, within Central Africa, within Congo, that he felt powerless to stop. But what was really annoying to him was he had no better information than he did you know, 15 years earlier in the Clinton administration. And he said, we have these incredible tools of science we have these incredible new ways of thinking about problems. How do we stop the genocide from occurring? How do we fundamentally understand conflict? And, and one of the ways that we've been trying to do so is thinking about questions like governance, which are essential. The failure of governance, is, it, it gives rise to the breeding grounds for conflict. So we launched a grand challenge around making all voices count, which on one part is about corruption and transparency for governments and how do we use technology to be able to address these. On the other side, it's about improving the relationship between people and their governments and actually having an open innovation challenge. And this is about to be launched uh, sometime this year. We've just, uh, we just selected the group that is um, putting together the grand challenge with us and we really want to see the best ideas coming from around the world. One of the things I didn't mention about the grand challenge is now uh, we get 500 to 600 applications as opposed to eight which aid usually would get for an RFP, 50% of them are now coming out of the developing world, which we find are extraordinary, and we are funding an increasing percentage of those. We also launched something called a Tech Challenge for Atrocity Prevention because we wanted to stop, we wanted to find new ways of stopping the people from enabling that challenge. Um, we wanted to uh, stop the f those that were financing, arming, coordinating atrocity perpetuators. So how could we actually have a consumer know that, for instance, a company is investing in a factory or investing within a country or has its factories in a country where there's trafficking in persons or where there's advancing atrocities? How do we actually use the power of the market to solve those problems? Uh, we were upset because you know, since 2002, the International Court of Justice has only convicted one person in its, in, in its time, 
in 10 years, we've only had one conviction. So how do we actually get the, 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 the data that we need to document atrocities? How do we actually fundamentally get, use new tools of science and technology to actually be able to convict more people that happen? How do we get better models of understanding what gives rise to atrocities? And we had a challenge on this. Um, these are all challenges. You go to techchallenge.org, I think it is. Uh, you, you, can, you can find these. Um, how do we get vulnerable populations the information they need to save their own lives because the international forces were not able to do that in Rwanda within what we're trying to do? Um, how do we get credible data uh, and how do, we be, how do we get the data we need to be able to stop what's happening as an international community? Last thing I'm going to talk about is, is very quickly, part of our goal in investing in the Conflict and Development Center and part of our goal in what was called this Higher Education Solutions Network, Conflict and Development uh, Lab, sorry, um, was how do we incentivize universities to think really differently? And if you think about universities, they tend to be siloed. Um, they, they, they're based on essentially a medieval system that hasn't actually changed very much. Uh, they're a little bit risk adverse. And it's not unlike aid, which tends to be siloed, uh, tends to be sort of uh, uh, stayed in its ways and risk adverse in itself. But what we realize are there's fundamental new ways that people are transferring knowledge around the world. This guy, uh, the Khan Academy has reached 262 million people on his YouTube channel. There's 4,100 courses that you can take for free on that channel. But there's entirely new ways of democratizing knowledge. In fact, aid, my office, uh, one of the things we helped create was a virtual science library for Iraq that provided 100% of Iraqis with with top tier university libraries through open source software and there are new open source journals that are out there. There are new databases and in fact libraries are now curators of data rather than just places that hold books. There are this entire new form of these massive open online courses that places like Duke with Coursera and Stanford with Coursera and Harvard and MIT and Berkeley with edX are using that have thousands of people enrolled in, in, in the classes. And the question is, how do we use, they will never replace, quite frankly, a brick and mortar institution, but they can deeply expand the reach of what we do to solve these problems, these, these problems of conflict. And our hope in terms of investing in these centers was inspired by curiosity, right? Curiosity is the thing that's currently the Volkswagen-sized bug uh, rover that's going around Mars. Um, what I really liked about it, uh, when I was at JPL, I visited it, them and they told me something very special. NASA would not allow Caltech to put JPL anywhere on curiosity. So if you see pictures of it on Mars, you'll never see the words JPL. But what they did was the tire tread of the rover actually spells out JPL in Braille. And that's the pattern it leaves on the surface of Mars, which I thought was really good. But what these guys at, at Caltech right, did, so you saw that control room of the guy with the Mohawk putting down, you know, these guys working to launch this thing and put it down on the surface of Mars. That was all at Caltech. That was all in a facility that's jointly managed by NASA. And our hope in development was to do the same. And they came up with this crazy idea. They would use, they would launch this thing all the way across, uh, all the way across the solar system. Uh, they had like a 15 minute delay in communication. So you couldn't do it in real time. You had to program it in advance and predict everything, including getting your metrics right, uh, including whether you're using the metric system or not. Uh, and then they had this idea of a sky crane that they would launch into the atmosphere of Mars, and then a rocket would stop it, blow off the cover underneath it, and then lower the rover onto the surface of Mars, and then the thing would fly away. There's a great video called Seven Minutes of Terror that really describes what the engineers were feeling, because they couldn't control that time period. They didn't know what was going to happen. Our hope was, by investing in universities as partners, as opposed to contractors, that we could create something different here in terms of this center. And we wanted to create this equivalent thing that would give us curiosity on Mars. We wanted a development lab that was creative, 
multidisciplinary that encourage universities to cut across the entire campus that would be laboratories for applying science, technology, and innovation, helping us get data, helping us evaluate technologies within what we're trying to do. And um, Texas A&M was one of those places that won that competition. And so I am really uh, honored to be here uh, because at the end of what we're trying to do, what development is, is actually diplomacy at the end of the day. It is the best kind of diplomacy, it particularly, particularly using science as a way to actually engage people like never before. It is a fundamentally different way than we've done diplomacy in the past. It is a way to build goodwill internationally. And so all of you that are participating within the center that are engaged within what we're trying to do are our diplomats. They're part of what we call our smart power. And I hope you all take the opportunity to really um, dare mighty things to help us achieve some of the grand challenges of our day. So with that, I think I'll end it and take some questions. Thank you very much. I'll give a discount. Uh, I'll only charge you half as much. She goes, uh, please. I'm sorry, I'm going to ask, I couldn't hear it, but I'll ask you if we can uh, use the microphone. The best of Western knowledge is um, kind of locked in peer-reviewed articles. Are there any programs where such articles are bought from the publishers and made available to certain communities? Well, the US government, one of the things we're trying to do is actually unlock uh, articles that are locked in these journals where you cannot access them. And in fact, there was a fundamental shift in policy that said, if your research is federally funded, which which it is. We require, I forgot what the timeline is now, I think it's like six months, we require it to be publicly available in that time. And, but our goal is also to make that data available through providing virtual science libraries that provide the equivalent of Texas A&M's online libra uh, library available to 50% of the countries in Africa. And we hope over the next few, we've started this in two countries that now have 100% access across their universities to journals. Uh, but we're hoping to expand that. It's part of building the ecosystem, I think, that's out there. Anyone else? Thank you very much. You mentioned about the Iraqi universities accessing the libraries around the world, but there is a main problem. They don't have the training. And they don't have the power to run their computers. So I am facing like several requests per month to send them data because they don't know how to use it. So they need more training, how well, to access to the data. We have, act, we have actually put a, a huge amount of effort in that training. And in fact, when we first did the virtual science library, we, you know, first month we had 100 people using it. I was ecstatic. And the next month we had 200 people and I was like dancing around the world because everyone told me it wouldn't work. They had no electricity, they had no computer access and no internet access. There are now 30,000 users of the system. Uh, if you don't use it, you're kicked off. So you have to use it within like a three month period or you get kicked off the system and have to re-register. And that takes a lot of time. And uh, there's been over uh, multiple millions of articles downloaded and we've seen an increase in publication rates that specifically cite articles that are available in the database. We have been actually investing an extraordinary amount in that training and then training of trainers, the librarians, the people within the universities. So, so we think that's having an effect. And I think the best part about it is that the Iraqi government now owns this, pays for this, and the United States is no longer involved in the process. But they've made a requirement of using scientific publications within any of their grants, any of their, as, as part of uh, their ability to get advancement within the university. So we see it as a potentially good thing. But training is a critical part of it, absolutely. 
So <clears throat> I guess the world never lacks geniuses and innovations. So my question is, how can we discover them, select them, and finally apply them to those developing countries to solve conflicts and finally uh, boost development in those world? Thanks. Well, we think, the, we think the challenges have been one really great way to do that uh, because, like we said, 50% of the applications in terms of how we're having challenges now come from the developing world. And, and the one thing we're realizing, we have another program called PEER, which is a great program. If you have an NSF grant or an NIH grant, you can apply for funding for your developing country counterpart. And, and they're $100,000, $200,000 grants. They're pretty substantial to help build your labs we're complementing it with equipment donations and trying to develop new sorts of frugal equipment to build capacity in developing countries. But what we realized is that um, talent is actually everywhere, but opportunity is not. And so part of what we've got to do is create the opportunities. And one of the great things that, one of the great ways opportunities happen is through partnerships between American universities and universities around the world. It, 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 it creates a legacy. Aid, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, trained uh, thousands of people that are now the leadership of many of these African countries, that are the ministers of those countries. We've got to figure out how through things like the HSN that we can do that again. Great, we'll take uh, one more question. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, actually, my question is, Kind of going off of what she was asking, uh, you mentioned bringing other ideas from other countries into the development programs here. Can you give us examples of such programs that you know we as Americans would never have considered possible or even an issue? And how do you, I guess, you essentially answered the question already about how do you kind of streamline those those ideas? Well, there's there's um, two things I think. Uh, w some of the other institutions that also were successful within this process um, include uh, Berkeley and MIT. And MIT is actually focused on design for the other 90%, but they're realizing it's got to be designed by the other 90%. And thinking about how do you, because the people who are closest to the problem have kind of the best insights. I mean, people in the developing world are incredibly innovative. If, you, if you've ever had a car fail somewhere in a really remote environment, you will understand uh, frugal engineering at, it, at its best. Um, and I think that's important. But the other aspect of it is, as we're thinking, for instance, as we're thinking about global health innovations, right? How can we replace lab equipment that costs 500,000, 10,000, 15,000 or something that costs a thousand or two hundred dollars or a hundred and fifty dollars and and we're doing so based on you know a couple of conditions environmental conditions that are much tougher right it's not appropriate technology appropriate technology is bs in my in my view uh and i'll i'll, I'll fight anyone for that or wrestle uh but but it is it is based on this idea it's world-class design it's world-class engineering it is educational levels that have a much greater disparity than what we do. So how do you actually think about that design? It is using nanotechnology or world-class technology to produce products that actually work for the developing world. It is thinking about a larger range of, of electricity and lack of availability of electricity, electricity spikes that's involved in there. And, when you, and it's about price points that are fundamentally below what we can afford to pay in this country. And one of the things we're hoping, another one of our centers is Duke University. Duke is excited about creating new technologies for global health because what they want to do is reduce healthcare costs in the United States. We pay 10 times as much as other countries for equivalent healthcare outcomes. And so how can we actually use frugal engineering to reduce our own healthcare costs at the same level of efficacy in what we're trying to do? And I think this is one of the ways that we can sort of get there. Thank you guys very much. Our job is, in conflict and development, 
It's a very big job, very broad job that can engage people from every discipline at Texas A&M. And I really appreciate uh, your, uh, Dr. Dagan for laying that out for us today. Uh, thank you very, very much for coming this morning. Uh, we're well along in our process of establishing the lab and getting it going. Last week we spent a full week with USAID with some of the top scientists in the, in the world to talk about conflict and development. We identified four questions that we're going to try to answer in four conflict-affected countries uh, as the initiation of our lab. And we'll be working with you on that over the years to come. Thank you very much for coming.